Hi there, this is Dr. Rob Sivis, the Carb Addiction Doc, back with another episode in understanding type 1 diabetes and looking at various perspectives of how to treat it better. So what's interesting as I look at the current management of type 1 diabetes and my own training as a doctor, and please understand the caveat to what I'm about to talk about, it's a story. I'm not giving medical advice. I don't have my doctor hat on. I'm just going through some plausible uh, ideology about how we can think about the management of type 1 diabetes a little bit differently. This is not a medical uh, treatment advice uh, talk. It's just a way to think a little bit differently. One of the benefits for me is that I'm old enough to have been trained in a non-American country in an era before we adopted the glycemic index or glycemic load method of diabetes treatment. Um, David Jenkins, who is the father of the glycemic index paperwork that was released in, he published it in 1981. And actually David Jenkins is a uh, doctor who practices in Toronto. And he was actually on my PhD committee um, in the 90s when I was doing my uh, liver transplantation glucose work. So I do know David, uh, um, Dr. Jenkins very well and understand his background and understand what he did. And he did some phenomenal work in understanding uh, diabetes and glycemic load, glycemic index. But I believe that the method of treating type 1s has become erroneous. And it has become that the treatment algorithm has actually caused a greater degree of harm than almost the disease itself. So in 1980-81, I was in medical school. And as a surgeon, um, going through medical school, going through my early residency, we saw a lot of patients who had type 1 diabetes coming in for surgery. And one of the things we would do in those days is that we'd admit them a few days before. We would, because I was trained as a doctor first, a global doctor first to treat the whole human, and then as a surgeon, as a specialty on top of being a doctor, not just being a specialist training first, which is a little bit of a challenge we can talk about at another time. However, we managed our type 1 diabetics in the hospital as surgical residents. And one of the key things that we would do with those patients, particularly when we were operating on the intestine or they came in with intestinal blockages or other problems, is they would be NPO. They wouldn't be able to eat or drink anything. And this was right at the beginning of America starting with the food pyramid and how important sugar was and how unimportant fat was. We hadn't bought into all that stuff and we certainly hadn't bought into the glycemic index management of diabetics yet. So the simple way in which we treated our type 1s is we would check their blood sugars on a regular basis, probably about every four hours. So we had regular measurements of their blood sugar. And then we had archaic forms of insulin. I know that. We had uh, really the poor sign of the bovine forms of insulin. We didn't have the ultra short acting insulins. But we placed our patients on what's called a sliding scale. And we treated their blood sugar. It sounds so simple. If their sugar was elevated, we knew what that number was. And we knew how much of the particular insulin we would use to bring that sugar down. And we controlled them pretty tightly. We controlled them below a, below a blood sugar of 100. And because we were checking it on a regular basis and we were, the nurses were trained to talk to the patients, we knew if they started to go low, we could put some sugar in their IV. Because the other concept was we didn't use a lot of sugar in our IVs. We used normal saline. We used Ringer's lactate. We didn't use a lot of dextrose. Because obviously dextrose is sugar. If you give that to a diabetic, now their blood sugar is going up and you have to control that. So we only used dextrose when somebody was low as a treatment for an overdose of insulin rather than as something that our type 1 diabetics had to have. You see the conceptual understanding? So type 1 diabetic comes in, we know that their liver is going to produce more than enough sugar for them. And the problem is that, in fact, the liver's production of sugar isn't dampened down by insulin when they're uh, uh, not eating or drinking anything. So under the influence of glucagon, maybe cortisol, the liver is pouring out sugar, producing it from amino acids and from fat, and pouring sugar out. And in the 1980s, the, the late 70s, early 80s, more of our type 1 diabetics were insulin sensitive rather than insulin resistant. It was really at the advent, the early parts of the real obesogenic era of our existence as a species. So we started before everyone was really fat, before we understood the glycemic index. And the advantage there was that we treated 
blood sugar without giving people sugar and without giving them sugar in their food. We understood this. We also knew that the healthiest diet for people was vegetables and meat. We didn't have a lot of carbohydrates in the hospital food. So even in those patients who weren't NPO, when they were eating, they were not eating the so-called standard American diet. They were eating pretty much a more ketogenic diet. And we also knew at the time that a diabetic diet meant no carbohydrates. So those were the fundamental principles at play when I was being trained. Plus, we had this wonderful advantage of having some guy called Tim Noakes as our physiology professor who taught us about human physiology, the interplay between all these hormones. So we were armed with this knowledge and we were not down the pathway of glycemic index training. So what's different in the modern era? And under, by the way, under those conditions, we treated blood sugar on an insulin sliding scale. And we were able to control that blood sugar very, very tightly in the sickest type 1 diabetics because we measured uh, uh, blood glucose often. We didn't feed them sugar unless it was absolutely necessary because they were low. And we had insulins that could provide a sliding scale with knowledge about how quickly that insulin would affect their blood sugar and how low a certain unit of insulin would drop them. Just a very simplistic way of treating them. But what happened after the glycemic index was released and more and more in the, after the acceptance of the USDA guidelines of 1977, where we have to eat 60% of our diet as carbohydrates and we shouldn't be eating fat, this whole introduction of a high carbohydrate diet, the standard American diet, endocrinologists and people who treat diabetes that were trained after 1980 were trained in the newer principles. And the change in diabetic principles was this. We now, because it's the healthiest diet is to eat, the standard American diet, so you're eating 60% of your calories as carbohydrates. So instead of ever really looking at blood sugar, we created these tables whereby we knew that if you ate a certain amount of this type of carbohydrate, you would need this amount of this type of insulin to bring that blood sugar down. And we tested blood sugar once or twice a day. We never ever looked at the hormones that were affecting that, insulins or glucagons, even though we had the ability at the time to test insulin. But we managed diabetics based upon what they ate, and we forced them to try to contain how much they ate at either 50 grams per meal, 75 grams per meal. And we also introduced this absolutely ludicrous anti-human concept of a snack. So now, instead of eating two or three times a day, we're now eating six to eight times a day, and every time there's a carbohydrate load going in. So the tide is always coming in. We're overwhelming our type 1 diabetics with massive amounts of carbohydrates, and then trying to manage their blood sugar peaks with insulin. Well, the damage gets done at the basal level. But the problem is if your blood sugar is doing this all the time, the danger is if you treat this number too aggressively or you don't, you've missed that balance, you go low. And as every type 1 diabetic knows, the greatest danger is a low. You will seize, you will you'll pass out, uh, um, you can have a stroke or die. It is an awfully scary place to be. And lows are very, very common in diabetics who are treated according to the glycemic index because you overdose on insulin or you underdose on sugar. So those are the fears. So what did we do? We raised the average basal amount of sugar that we accept for a type 1. So type 1s basally should be around 120, 150, 110. I've, I've seen all kinds of numbers. But we don't use an 80 or a 90 as an average basal with maybe a 10, uh, a 10 point change on that because of the risk of lows. So we accept and we are thrilled when we can keep our type 1 diabetics around 120 on the glycemic index. That's crazy. That's an extraordinarily high blood sugar. And at that level, you now have type 2 diabetes. In other words, you have damage from that excess blood sugar, that average level of blood sugar, to, to the blood vessels of every organ of every, uh, uh, of every part of your body. And that's the type 2 diabetes effect. So type 1 diabetics typically get the damage 
of type 2 diabetes because their blood sugars are not tightly controlled enough and their basal blood sugars are too high because of the risk of the low in the glycemic index or the glycemic mode model. So, and most endocrinologists treat patients based on what they eat and dose insulin according to what they eat, either by injection, short-acting, long-acting, or by an insulin pump. To my mind, that's a ludicrous way of managing anybody. Okay, eat all the sugar, then we're going to give you drugs to move the sugar out of your bloodstream. It, it doesn't make sense, people, and we know that it causes massive amounts of harm, okay? So then there's some endocrinologists out there that understand, okay, this low-carb thing works. It helps us instead of getting these wide fluctuations in blood sugar, and it's not uncommon for me to see type 1s manage it on a glycemic index. To I had one last week who came in with a blood sugar of 425, totally happy, not in diabetic ketoacidosis, unaware of this. Why? Because it's happened for such a long period of time that they become used to it. Okay? That's how badly diabetes is managed. And I see about two to, two to ten new diabetics per day in my office. So this is not me just talking about the odd one that I see. I see a ton of diabetics. Anyway, um, the point is this that managing patients with a glycemic index, asking them to tightly control their carbohydrates, and then to guesstimate how much insulin they need is ludicrous, and you're still seeing this in their blood sugar. So some endocrinologists, wise endocrinologists, have said, okay, you know what? We understand that we really have very, very poor glycemic control when people are eating a lot of carbohydrates, and they've, they've listened somewhat skeptically and then positively to the whole ketogenic movement from Dr. Adkins in the 90s all the way through to where we are right now in the keto movement. They said, wow, you know what? We see some type 2 diabetics come off their uh, medication. For example, Tracy Brown, the current head of the American Diabetes Association, was a type 2. She's put that into remission by coming off carbohydrates. At least that's my understanding. So more and more influential people are able to treat their diabetes better by coming off carbohydrates. The problem is that endocrinologists are still, for the most part, completely locked into treating what we eat. So they still dose based on what you eat. So if you're going to eat a ketogenic diet, let's say you're going to eat a big steak, they're still dosing according to that. And there's a concern for me. Yes, absolutely, you want to monitor your blood sugar. But don't preemptively treat, because now if your blood sugar goes down, what do you have to do? You have to eat some sugar, or drink some milk, or do something else. So you can't get away from the consumption of carbohydrates. The model that we use, and, and again, here's the assumption. The assumption is that we can motivate our type 1 diabetics to eat a true ketogenic diet. And a true ketogenic diet for a type 1 diabetic does not, does not have a carbohydrate allowance. And what I love about 2020, guys like Sean Baker have made a carnivore way of eating tolerable. So let's go from glycemic load or glycemic index treating, and let's talk about pure carnivore, pure animal products, eggs, cheese, meat, fish, poultry, high fat, uh, moderate protein, and you eat the protein that comes along with the fat. How do we use that? Now, this is a radical example, of course, because somewhere in the middle is probably the where most type 1 diabetics can be. But let's use the carnivore example. At first, so, so the first concept when my type 1 diabetics come in is 100% of them, 100% of them are insulin resistant. In other words, their liver and their tissues has become resistant to the very insulin they're giving themselves. You don't fix insulin resistance in a day. It takes about 90 to 120 days, about two to three months, three to four months, for a type 1 diabetic to begin to become insulin sensitive, to begin to become sensitive to the insulin they're injecting. So it's critically important that we monitor that over the time. So when they come in, their liver is not able to use tiny amounts of insulin to remove sugar from the bloodstream, and the amount of insulin they need to modify glucagon, to modify cortisol, is enormous, and even then they're resistant to it, so you're not seeing that effect. Okay? 
So we've got massive swings in cortisol, massive swings in glucagon, massive swings in blood sugar, and insulin resistance. That's how my type 1 diabetics come into my office. And when we start them and we slowly introduce them to a carnivore diet, we don't do it in a day, but over the course of about a month or so, we get them progressively, if they're willing to do it, to be pure carnivore. And at first, we get them into ketosis, where their ketone bodies are positive between about 0.5 and 5. We don't want them to go above 5, and if they're at 0.5, I'm fine with that, but their blood sugars are still fluctuating quite a bit. And slowly over time, those large fluctuations flatten out a little bit. And we typically run our type 1s around 120. Again, we're worried about that low to begin with. And then for those folks that are interested in going carnivore, as they reduce how much insulin they require to maintain their blood sugar around 120, and, and remember, this is not permanent. This is the starting point because we want to mitigate risk. And most of these guys come in with average blood sugars of 150, 180, 200. So this is not your tightly controlled diabetic. But we bring those type 1s down to an average of around 120. We eventually try to get the fluctuation to be around 5 to 10 points around the 120. And we back off very quickly on their insulin utilization as they become more and more insulin sensitive, whether they're using long acting or short acting combinations, whether they're on a, on a Humalog, Novolog pump, we back off. But here's the fundamental difference. With every endocrinologist I've ever spoken, of, spoken to, every endocrinologist, even the low carb ones, is we do not treat diet. The beauty about the ultra short acting insulins is that we can treat the number. And the things that you require is you, the, the ideal management for me is a patient with a continuous glucose monitor where you're getting a blood sugar reading every five minutes. That's the first thing. The second thing is somebody who has access to Humalog or Novolog. Why is that important? Because those are the ultra short acting insulins. And then we ask our diabetics to do an experiment. To eat a sugar load and to watch their CGM and you'll see the spike and then you'll see the, the blood sugar come down and then to treat at a certain point and to see the speed at which their Humalog or Novolog works, what's the lag time, and how much does one unit of insulin drop your blood sugar. We need those metrics because those are going to be fundamental in terms of helping our type 1 diabetics to treat their blood sugar. And that's the fundamental difference. The fundamental difference is we don't care so much about what you're eating as long as it's ketogenic. We treat the blood sugar, not the diet. So as those folks migrate more and more to a high-fat carnivore diet, over the ensuing three to four months, they've gone from being widely ranging diabetics to better controlled blood sugar in a, on a ketogenic diet where they're living off ketone bodies and just a little bit of sugar, and the amount of sugar their tissues require becomes less and less as their body acclimatizes to using ketones. And then when they switch over to going pure carnivore, over time, three to four months, they become fat adapted. Now, what does fat adapted mean? Fat adapted specifically means that their tissues, those that can use both sugar or fat, preferentially use ketones rather than glucose. Of course, there are going to be certain uh, uh, cells, for example, your red blood cells, that always need a little bit of sugar. But the second part is that under the influence of glucagon, gluconeogenesis can provide either new sugar or it can turn amino acids, and it's not quite gluconeogenesis, but you, you're, under glucagon, you can either produce sugar from amino acids and glycerol, or you can produce ketone bodies. There are certain amino acids that swing both ways, either go to sugar or ketones, and there's some that can only go to ketones. So what's important about glucagon is you want glucagon producing more ketone bodies from amino acids and less sugar. My whole body right now, I'm fat adapted, has around four to five grams of sugar in my entire bloodstream. That's a tiny, tiny amount, okay? That's four grams. Of, of, of carbohydrates, that's about 20, sorry, about 16 calories. So very, very small amount, okay? So um, when you're fat adapted, you don't need to produce a huge amount of sugar to keep you stable. But you do need more and more ketone production, ketone release from your fat cells, and then ketone production. And all your insulin is required then to do 
is to move small amounts of sugar into your tissues, but more importantly, just to modify glucagon. So one of the most important aspects to understand is that as you make these changes, you've got to be really on the ball. You've got to know exactly what your numbers are all the time because this is a dynamic process. One of the concerns I have a lot about the way a lot of endocrinologists treat their patients is they'll tell them what to do and then they won't see them for two or three months. My patients get my cell phone number. I speak to them on a weekly basis, if not more often, and they have access to me 24-7 when they have questions because in this transformation, it becomes dynamic. My patients don't abuse that, that privilege but it's available to them should they have questions to keep them safe. So what we do in the transformative phase, we have to stay very tight. And then my diabetic patients become better experts than I am about how their body works. But we have to educate them and give them the feedback tools. Because just like insulin, glucagon, and all these other hormones are acting on a feedback basis all the time, they respond to the environment within your body and what you're doing to it what we're adding to the equation with our type 1 diabetics is to give them the tools to respond to their diets. No tables, no do this, do that. It's dynamic. It fluctuates all the time. So the ideal situation for me is a type 1 diabetic who has an ins a CGM, a continuous glucose monitor, and an insulin pump and they're on Humalog or Novalog, and possibly even something like the tandem pump, which is sensitive to rises and lows, so that even if they're not on the ball, it'll switch itself off, because the lows are still an issue. But the lows are less of an issue if eventually you become a fat-adapted omnicarnivore with a carnivore base. That's what we're looking for, okay? And the best way to get there is to do carnivore for a few months, and then slowly introduce some vegetables back once you've got insulin-sensitive dynamics. Because the goal here is to become sensitive to the insulin you're injecting. And in the next section, we'll talk about the difference between type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes in type 1 diabetics. Because the problem with type 1s is their type 2 component. So let's go through this again. If endocrinologists could only go back, rewind the clock to pre-1980, possibly even pre-1977, we've got much better tools, we've got much better insulins, but, and we've got CGMs, and we've got much better sensitivities. However, the two things that we require is to rid ourselves of the concept that carbohydrates are essential for life, get back before the 1977 ridiculous food guidelines that made us fat and type 2 diabetics, and also in the pre-glycemic index, glycemic load days. Let's manage blood sugar based on the number, not a predicted number, okay? And if you can make that one change as a type 1, the majority of my type 1s that do this effectively are able to get their A1Cs between 4.6 and 5.2. Incredible, isn't it? And at that point, you are insulin sensitive and sugar is no longer causing damage to your bloodstream. And your insulin utilization is trivial. Now, of course, under those situations, cortisol sensitivity is going to be an issue. So we've got to account for certain things like a lack of sleep, like exercise. But, but those are things that you see right away. And you can keep your blood sugar in a very, very tight control if you treat that preemptively, just like your pancreas would. But if you allow these wide fluctuations, that's where the problem occurs. So... Yes, Dr. Bernstein, for example, did a wonderful job about talking about a low-carbohydrate treatment for type 1 diabetics. Phenomenal, radical change in thinking. But we need to go beyond that. We need to go beyond treating what we eat and start treating our blood sugar numbers. We have the tools. And the final part of ridiculousness is that I can buy a Fitbit for less than $100 but I can't buy a CGM for under $1,200 for three months. That is ludicrous. I just so wish that the federal government in this country would force CGMs to be cheaply available. Because to deprive a type 1 diabetic of easy, cheap access to insulin and to, uh, um, and to a CGM, in my humble opinion, is tantamount to killing people.
You spend all this money on opioid crisis. You go after all these drug companies that have lied to us about uh, opioids and selling us opioids and all that kind of thing. And you spend all this energy on that. And yet we're not treating a disease that people didn't do to themselves, type 1 diabetes. So that's my discussion. I don't want my type, I don't want type 1 diabetics to say, aha, this is what I'm going to do and start experimenting with themselves. There are a lot of pitfalls. I've given you a generalization. In our practice, we have those nuances. We can give people those skills and tools. And even if you're not prepared to go pure carnivore, we can certainly manage that. But if you're going to do anything, come off the glycemic index, come off the frequent snacks, get to one or two meals a day, too mad, oh mad and more ketogenic if you can, and that'll tighten your control. And then slowly become aware of what your blood sugars are, as opposed to trying to look up on tables how much calories you're eating or how much carbohydrate calories you're eating. That is not an effective way to manage type 1 diabetes. So if you're interested, give me a shout. We do consults now all over the world. I've got to take my doctor hat off when I'm not a licensed in your state doctor, but we can still discuss some of the biological theory. And often we'll work with in tandem with the doctor in your local state who will provide the doctoring and we can provide some of the concepts. But give me a shout. Um, you can either message me at Carb Addiction Doc on, on Facebook or you can text our office to 561-517-0642. Remember, I'm not playing doctor here. It's just guidance. It's just helping you to think a little bit differently.